Okay. <coughs> okay, cool. So uh, Victor Worth, that uh, he's here. Maybe he joined us or yeah, I need to see where the meeting is. I don't I don't do I don't do Zoom, that's for sure. Okay, cool. Victor is here with us. So um, I guess uh, we can start. Um, hi everybody, welcome to the Volto add-ons training, the second edition. I'm uh, Tiberiu and uh, I'm a developer with Odd Web Romania. I've been working uh, with Volto since uh, 2019 some, or something like that. And uh, uh, before that, I was uh, a clone developer and a Python developer. Uh, since uh, around 2003, I've been working with clone. So I got, got, I got quite a lot of history with clone. And uh, Victor, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm Victor. And I'm uh, in the community since, uh, I don't remember when. <laughs> Uh, I've been developing uh, Volta since the first iteration, uh, since Clone React, and doing uh, projects with Volta since also the first iteration four five years ago. Uh, yeah, I'm also the um, release manager of uh, Volta, um, and yeah, uh, I guess that's it. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, so um, in this training, this is a, this is a training that's more or less thought as an, an advanced uh, Volto training. Uh, there, there is some other introductory introductory trainings uh, for React for uh, Volto, uh, and this this one is the advanced Volto uh, training. Uh, in it, we are looking at how how to develop a a simple data table block. But with this tutorial, we'll uh, look at uh, actually best practices because this training was developed uh, from based on the experience that we have working with uh, our biggest client, EEA, the Environmental European Environmental Agency. And in that uh, work, we've come up with uh, some best practices. Uh, these uh, are shared in this training. Uh, a lot of uh, this experience uh, went into VoltoCore already, and uh, this is a training just to uh, to share that experience and to, to make you really, really, really uh, productive with Volto. And um, and yeah, um, and you can make quite advanced uh, things quite fast with Volto, and uh, we'll teach you how to do that. Um, in the process, we will build this. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure that you're already familiar with the Volto interface. In case you're not, uh, it's a it's an interface on top of Plone. Uh, it's all running in React as a single page application. So uh, we are developing this uh, data table block where we're going to be able to uh, pick a file, a CSV file that I've already uploaded into the system, like this. That a file will be read through the network into the table and then displayed. Uh, we will have uh, customization possibilities for uh, for this, like um, yeah, some styling for the for the table, um, and that's really really fast to implement. And then, uh, which is the most uh, interesting stuff, uh, we'll be able to uh, customize how to display uh, this data table. We will be able to pick from, for example, from uh, uh, from the file, some columns uh, that are in that file. And I don't know, let me pick something like this. Um, and we'll be able to apply formatting and we'll be able to, um, to pick templates for it. And when we save it, it's gonna display uh, like this uh, in, in the view. 
so what uh, what's going to be um, the end point of this training? By that time, we will go through the process of bootstrapping Volto, uh, bootstrapping an add-on into that Volto uh, project, and then uh, start developing. And uh, this training uh, is already published at uh, training.plon.org. Yeah, I think uh, this address will change. Let's see if, no, it's not uh, already done so. Uh, but in principle, I, I think uh, this file will no longer be there. In, in any case, you can access it from the, from the main page, go to uh, Volto add-ons development and uh, like this. Um, based on that last year's experience um, and yeah, what I've, uh, uh, what I've, um, let's say, find out uh, since then. It is pretty hard to, to have this more like a hands-on training because uh, we are, I'm here, I don't have uh, an immediate feedback with you uh, guys watching. Um, so in many, in many cases, it is uh, possible to regard this uh, training like uh, as a walkthrough, walk through uh, this training. I will walk you through this published training and uh, we can, uh, I, I will give comments on what we, what we see and we can discuss, you can raise questions. And uh, if you uh, want to try, you can, uh, you, yeah, you can try to follow along. From my perspective, the biggest, 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 uh, uh, let's say challenges come in the, in the first steps. Um, where, you know, it's really easy to mess a path and uh, if it's a new environment, you don't really know uh, much about it. So every error, no matter how simple it is, it's actually quite difficult to, um, to understand what the problem is. So I think the, the introduction, the, the bootstrapping of this uh, uh, Volta add-on should be a hands-on process and we can uh, stop and dedicate time to that. Uh, but after that, we will go through uh, more quickly uh, with the training. And then uh, I hope by the end of uh, this training, which will happen uh, tomorrow, I hope that uh, we will have finished early so that we can uh, like really, really, really try to develop new, new things uh, based on what we have uh, already built. Um, so let's make sure that we get uh, this, uh, we, we get Volto running on your computer and we get this add-on that we're building running on your computer so that you, you have time today or tomorrow morning, you have time to, um, to play with it. And uh, so that you gain actual experience uh, with this. So far, so good. Any uh, yes. comments? Okay. Any questions? No? Okay, so um, I'm gonna share my screen. I mean, I'm already sharing it, but uh, I'll show you um, my terminal. And I have the tendency of switching really fast between uh, screens and uh, yeah, if, if you happen to, um, to be confused about what I'm editing, where I'm editing, what I'm doing, just let me know and uh, I will try to uh, clarify that. Okay. Um, so I guess, yeah, let's, let me start, stop everything just to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if we go in here, I've already um, shown you uh, the product, but we have here uh, our prerequisite. And this is uh, the Docker command to quickly boot a plone um, database, a plone service, and use it, it uses Docker. If you have already plone running with plone REST API, you're fine, you're good to go. Other, otherwise, and I, I recommend that you do that uh, for this training. Just copy that command, paste it in the terminal, and then 
they will start quite fast. Okay, uh, now that we have uh, Volto running, uh, this one will create, will automatically create a website. So if you go to uh, Zoop on port 8080, we already have a website created and this website already has Volto, is, is Volto integrated. Um, uh, let's see. If we log in with admin admin, um, and then we can go into the site setup, add-ons, Plone REST API is already uh, installed, and then the Plone Volto add-on, which uh, takes care of the Volto integration. Okie dokie. So now that we have uh, Plone running, uh, if you want to stop or if you have uh, problems, difficulties, just let me know and uh, we can maybe stop and look at the problems or... Um, next thing to do... Um, maybe this is an alternative uh, a way of st starting clone. Um, and the next thing to do is to bootstrap a new Volta project. So we have uh, this command. One uh, piece of advice while we wait this for uh, to run. In I have just run an npm install with global mode. Uh, if if you run the same command on your system and you get a, a prompt for a pseudo writes or you get uh, uh, an error that you don't have sufficient rights to install the package, I would say you're doing something wrong uh, in the sense that when doing development, we want to use um, local installations. And, uh, the way to do that is to use a node version manager, for example. So uh, if you go to the docsvoltocms.com website, you look at boot, bootstrap Volto page, it has instructions. Uh, let's see where it is. Uh, yeah, here. It, it has instructions on how to install uh, MVM, the Node Version Manager. And this one allows you to quickly change between Volto, uh, between Node versions and re install them really fast. And uh, it will create a local or a user installation of Node so that you don't need to, um, to use sudo or you don't need uh, system permissions to install Node packages. And uh, it, if this one is even better because maybe you have already a node on your system. If you install a package, maybe it will break some system dependency or something. Um, so this one, uh, like this with the node uh, version manager is uh, a lot safer. Okay, so uh, your install, uh, your one is a scaffolding, scaffolding tool. Uh, we use it uh, to generate uh, a to generate a new Volta project. So basically we have some templates, we have some files that act as templates. We copy them into the Volta project and uh, they serve as uh, these templates and we, yeah. Um, so next step would be to install the generator Volta. Um, I'm doing uh, this for the benefit of our uh, viewers who, who don't have a lot of experience already with Volto. So 
uh, this step would, should be clear, but uh, in case uh, you've already started developing with Volto and you know this, yeah, congratulations, but <laughs> have a little bit of patience. Uh, okay, so now we can, uh, we can bootstrap our Volto project. Okay, so a quick introduction to what bootstrapping is or why, why should uh, Volto be bootstrapped? Uh, Zoop, for example, runs as an application server. We have Zoop running, uh, we, we boot Zoop, it, it, it runs Plone and so on, uh, but it's a centralized installation. Um, with Volto, things are a little bit different. We have to create a customized version of this Volto for each project. And Volto itself becomes not a standalone application, but a library. And that library it is used by our Volto project. And the Volto project uh, is a standalone Node.js application that's using Volto as a library. OK, so. Um, here in the prompt, uh, we should say no, we don't want to use add-ons, or should we say yes? Okay. Choose false, it says in the training. So we won't do that. Um, if we... Tiberio, I see your Chrome. You should switch to the terminal if... Um, I, I will restart the stop of uh, the uh, sharing screen because I'm <laughs> I'm on my other screen. Okay. Uh, share screen. Share screen. Like this. Do you use, do you see my terminal? Yes. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. I'm going to bring the, the browser to the same um, to the same window so that we can switch between them to the same desktop. Uh, now, you see, again, you see my terminal, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, this, the bootstrapping created the Volta project. Uh, we can uh, remember, our command was yo, initialize, use the plone volto uh, generator template and initialize a new thing that we called volto tutorial project. Oops. So now I can change directory to the volto pro uh, tutorial project and I can run yarn start, which starts volto. Um, if you don't already have a fast computer <laughs> and you want to uh, do a lot of Volto development, it's a good idea to get a fast computer. And the best ones are desktop computers, but um, there are some reports that the Apple M1 processor machines are quite, quite fast with uh, Volto. And this... Um, um, start boot time. Okay, oh, hold on a second. Okay, so now uh, in the browser, I can go to localhost 3000, the port where Volta runs, and I can uh, I can see Volta that it, it's running and it's already started and so on. And if I click to add a new page, I get the usual Volto blocks. Okay. So now that uh, the uh, Volto project is start is bootstrapped, we have to create uh, the, the add-on, and we do that following um, the instructions in the tutorial. So we do that and it says here in the Volta project root, that is the folder that we've just created. So I will copy this command, stopping Volto. 
I will run the command, you'll add plumb ball to add-on. So it's using the same um, generator, but kind of like a sub template inside that generator. And it's asking me for um, a name. And the convention is to use the clone collective um, namespace in case you're doing an uh, uh, open source uh, add-on. And it's a good idea, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's a good idea uh, to contribute as many as possible, as many Volta add-ons as possible, because Volta is great and it needs our love. And uh, I'm gonna say Volto data table tutorial. I think, uh, but let me just confirm. Sorry, what, uh, yeah, Volto data table tutorial. That, that should be the name. So Volto data table tutorial, that's my add-on name. And it created, uh, it created some file, it says. They are not here. So if I um, um, we're we're gonna look at them right away. A photo add-on is actually a node package. There's nothing almost fancy about it. Um, so you develop it uh, as as you would do on any other node. Uh, uh, package. Uh, we are right now, we are in the Volta project folder. Um, these are files that are, uh, these are the files that are necessary to run Volta. Our add-on has been created in the source folder. So if we go to source, add-ons, and then Volta data tape in, in the add-ons actually, if we look, we only have one add-on, our uh, our add-on. So we, we will go to the Volta Data Table tutorial, and then uh, let's let's look at the at the at the structure. Um, we have bubble config, make file, uh, package.json, and uh, source that are important let's say important files. The package.json and the source folder are the most important uh, things to have in, in an add-on. Uh, if we look at the package.json, we can see a, a regular um, node package of the name and uh, the main. These are, these are the requirements. Um, for a node package, but also the main is really, really important uh, for Volto. And that is because the main, that is source index, is, uh, is executed by Volto when Volto starts. So we have, we have this uh, function inside that's already generated the apply config. This one is kind of like, uh, let's say, configure ZCML in, uh, in Plone. We use it to get some configuration. We adjust that configuration so we can do anything inside with this uh, config object that we receive here. We return that configuration that has been mutated or yeah, you, you, can, you can even uh, create a new copy of it or you can come up with something else, but usually we just mutate this configuration object and then we export the default uh, function. We export it as the default uh, function from this module. We can, uh, um, we can add multiple such um, functions inside here. So I can declare, for example, uh, install some optional dependency. And that will be, an, will be a function, again, that looks just like above. And we have to return, always have to return the config. And of course, we can export it, not as the default, but just uh, by name. So it can be imported by name. Now, um, 
um, just just having this uh, uh, add-on generated doesn't mean that it's already loaded inside uh, Volto. We have to go back to Volto. So now I'm in I'm, I'm back in the the Volto project right here. We have to edit the package.json. And here inside this add-ons key, we have to declare that we want to load um, our add-on. So it should be the, the node.js package name, Volto collect, clone collective, Volto data table tutorial. So right, now, right here we have not the path where we have it, but the node.js package name. Package name. Okay, um, there is, I mean, there are, there are quite a lot of uh, intricacies to, to packaging for JavaScript. And even after, yeah, so much time uh, working with it and um, like re digging into quite a lot, of, uh, encountering quite a lot of problems and digging into, into quite a lot of uh, situations, it is still hard uh, this, uh, to, to produce JavaScript packages, to have them integrated. You always, um, there's always questions and problems like, should I transpile my package? Uh, do I need to, to package, it, uh, packages, package it as um, browser? I mean, as a common GS package or, or browser package or whatever. And, uh, can I export the JavaScript modules? Can I, or should I export uh, um, the uh, old Node.js, uh, Common.js uh, uh, files, and so on? Fortunately, Volto makes this uh, process easy for us. Uh, with Volto, you don't have to transpile your add-on. Uh, you just have to ship it as source and Volto will deal with the transpilation. That, that means that uh, when developing an add-on, if you have dependencies, uh, your, your add-on depends on some other third-party packages, you have to use a Volto or rather the Volto project. It has to become a monorepo. And that means that um, Yarn, which is the package manager we use with Volto, will have to know that your add-on path uh, is a workspace, uh, is something that will be considered as a location to look for uh, dependencies and um, yeah, to, to include when installing uh, the, the whole system. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, one of, one possible way of dealing, for example, with uh, the whole um, development process is to use Mrs. Miss Dev or Mrs. Developer, and I think, or oh, sorry, this should be explained um, here in the tutorial. Okay, so um, let's go. Let's go uh, with the tutorial. So now that we have scaffold uh, our, we have the scaffolding, we have our add-on uh, created, we need to go and edit the gsconfig uh, file. So inside the Volto tutorial project, we will find this file. Um, and this one will instruct our um, let's say compiler, compiler or the the overall build system, it will instruct and uh, we'll be able to create uh, aliases, for example, to say okay this package lives at this location, so that we can um, switch between having an add-on installed in node modules, for example, if or uh, a third-party dependency uh, that that is let's say packaged or rather distributed. So it will be a distributed package, then it will be installed here in the node modules. Or if we have it as a develop pack package, then it's gonna live inside here in the add-ons folder. 
and uh, you can use uh, misdev to manage that process. Uh, but if we don't use it, we have to basically come here and edit this uh, GS config file on our own. So from here. Uh, so, um, and basically we have to, to say this, we have to say that, um, I'm just pasting, that this JavaScript package name, right, lives in this location. And you notice that uh, this location, uh, it starts with add-ons because the base URL, which is listed here lower, um, will serve as the root. So basically it's gonna uh, become source slash add-ons and so on. Okay, so now um, let's go back and see. We have listed the add-ons here. We have listed, um, uh, we have list we have listed the add-on path here in the GS config, and now when we start Volto, uh, it shouldn't complain that uh, that something is wrong. Um, is anybody following uh, the steps? Do you do you, did you encounter problems? Do you want to stop? Um, now that I, uh, I'm taking a look at the, at the Slack conference uh, channel room, um, Victor is mentioning that uh, there is a certain convention, which uh, at, at the beginning we didn't really uh, follow it, but now it is uh, a recommendation that the add-on should be named in a particular way. So clone collective namespace use it or not, yeah, that's, uh, that's your choice. But the add-on name should be like um, Volto, Volto XXX uh, block, Volto XXX um, widget. So it would be kind of like Volto, what, what we have, data table block, right? or Volto grid block or whatever. And of course, there are uh, keywords that you should use so that uh, yeah, we make uh, Volto more uh, visible. Okay, so Volto started uh, and let me open a new terminal. Uh, I'm using uh, Tmux for uh, terminal multiplexing. So I'm gonna switch between uh, the first terminal, which I'll say that it's named yarn start. You can, you can see it here at the bottom. The second terminal, which is, ah, this is just a convention. That's how I work. And the third terminal, which I'll bring here to the second position. We are gonna say that I'm editing the tutorial and uh, okay, I'm going to start an editor here and I'm going to edit um, the only uh, JavaScript module that we have right now, which is the index, right? So with Volto started, I can go here and just to confirm that our uh, add-on is loaded, I will console log the, com the config. Okay, now if I go back into Volto, I'm gonna open the developer console. And let's see what we have here. Um, I don't know why I have those errors, but we have to make sure that uh, our add-on is properly loaded. Let me try again. Okay, 
So, um, yeah, this is the configuration register for Volto. And let me tell you, as a, as a Plone developer, this is awesome. The fact that you are able to inspect uh, the configuration system of the system, it's really, really great because it, it makes it possible to understand and debug problems uh, because this registry will be looked up, will be used in a lot of cases and will be, yeah, uh, it will be a lot easier to debug if you have uh, problems and, and uh, situations. Okay, so um, we won't look at the configuration registry too much right now. Uh, we've confirmed that our add-on is loaded. What else do we need to do? Um, yeah, that's the, that's the optional. I won't do it right now because yeah, it's uh, not the time, but uh, I really, really recommend that uh, you use Miss, uh, Mrs. Developer uh, when developing auto add-ons because it makes it easy to, um, yeah, to switch between uh, the add-on life cycles. Is it production, is it development and so on. And you'll probably want to collaborate with other people on open, even open source packages. So with this tool, you'll be able to bring them into the system and work, start working on them by yourself. Okay, so uh, the tutorial recommends that we add the add-on as a workspace. Uh, that means we inform Yarn that uh, it needs to treat the add-on location as a workspace so that our project becomes a monorepo. Uh, and that is to be able to, um, to add dependencies to this uh, uh, package. Okay, so back into Volto, uh, we need to that back into the root of the Volto project, right? So I'm I'm here. I'm gonna edit the package.json and I will add a, the add-on path source add-ons uh, and the, the add-on path is actually we can look here Volto data table tutorial, right? And I'm missing Volto here. Okay. With this change, if we go here back into the uh, Volto root project, uh, yarn workspaces info, we can run this command. Okay. It it complains that it cannot be it can only be run in private projects, and that is because if we look here in package.json, again, in the root. This is false, we need to set it to true. And that means that we are not able to publish this uh, Volto project to NPM. That's, I mean, that's not any tragic uh, thing because we wouldn't publish it anyway. Okay, so uh, now if we run the command again, we see uh, our uh, package has been picked up, it has a location, proper location, and so on. Um, so, oh, hold on, I'm, um, uh, I, I think I should, uh, yeah, follow the tutorial and talk a little bit about what you can do with the add-on, and we can look at the uh, configuration with that for that purpose, but uh, if we are, we are still here, let's add the dependency to our add-on, which we're gonna use later. So yeah, work, workspace, plone, yeah, I'm gonna use the command history. So plone collective Volto data table tutorial, that's the name of our package, we're gonna add a new dependency, which is papa parse. Okay, now if you already used yarn uh, to add dependencies in a, in a Node.js package, you know that there are two types of dependencies. 
or more, but uh, let's keep it to two types. Deve uh, development de dependencies and let's say real or uh, production development uh, dependencies. From this, from, from this point, from the add uh, word here, we can add the, the other uh, yarn switches. For example, if I would add uh, the development package, I would need to use the minus D switch here, right? So basically yarn workspace, this part becomes a prefix for the yarn command that follows. And that will add uh, the Papa parse dependency inside the data table tutorial. Okay, so I'm gonna do that now. And we can uh, look at the result. So back in my um, data table tutorial folder, which is the add-on folder, right? If I look in the package.json, it was updated with the dependency, the Papa parse dependency. Now, uh, when developing add-ons, you will sometimes see node modules folders um, created here in the add-on location. And JavaScript packaging uh, is like, it works really, really nice in the sense that you can have uh, multiple versions of the same library. And that's something that I don't know how to achieve with Python, but yeah, who knows? Um, but if, uh, if Yarn detects that we have multiple requirements, that we have requirements pointing to multiple versions of the same um, library, it will stash that version inside the package that required it. So that uh, it doesn't have a conflict, but other, otherwise yarn will, uh, will hoist. That means it will lift all the dependencies into the top level uh, folders. So now if we look at, uh, for example, no, no modules, I'm just gonna count, right? The, the numbers of, uh, of the lines that that should give us an idea on the number of add-on the number of packages that were installed for this Bolto project. Yeah, uh, it's it's that crazy number that uh, everybody complains when uh, talking about uh, JavaScript development these days. Uh, but inside, we will see that we also have uh, Papa Parse. Yeah, let's just. Yes, Papa. Okay, so uh, our Papa parse dependency was added. It was added as a declared dependency in uh, in our add-on, but the package itself was hoisted to the top level. So it is here. In case, for example, you're uh, interested in in um, reading the source code, uh, it's it's a little bit strange. But that's that's a process usually. So if I look here in in my Papa parse dependency, the first thing I should do is look at the package.json and I'm looking for the main entry and that tells me which um, which JavaScript file uh, will uh, will contain, let's say the main entry point for this package. In case I'm loading it directly in, in the browser, this file will be uh, used. So now, um, hold on, yeah. That means I have to look here in the Papa parse.js. Now, usually the JavaScript packages, they are, um, they are shipped as transpiled. So some of the things will be just noise for us if, you're, if we're trying to, um, to understand what happens here. But it is possible, for example, to get an idea of, of uh, what happens, and it is possible for, like, really uh, to to go in at the debugger line and and yeah, in case you were using an, a third party dependency and have issues and you're trying to yeah figure out something. Um, most of the time, you will have to to hunt the 
the location of the original source code and look at the source code in non-transpiled non mode. <clears throat> okay, so uh, back into the Volto project. Um, I should tell you what add-ons uh, are really about and what they can do. Um, and the story is that like kind of like this. Um, with with add-ons, we are more or less mimic, mimicking the clone add-ons uh, in the sense that we want to have we want to have them self-contained, and we want to have all the power to change the system with with them. So that's why they get the configuration system, and they that's why they are able to mutate it so that they can influence everything. And uh, among the things that uh, an add-on can change. Uh, they they are provide additional views and blocks, and that means uh, let me quickly uh, move some of these so that I can switch them here. That means they can add new things here uh, in the views, like they can register a new view for a new content type that you are de developing, uh, or they can even change the default view. They can do anything. Um, they override or extend Volto built-in views, blocks, and settings, uh, which I've mentioned. It is possible to shadow uh, Volto. And uh, if you've taken the uh, introductory Volto course, you know that it is possible to basically uh, create a mirror of any Volto file with your own customized copy, and it will uh, it will override the Volto file. And that is thanks to Webpack aliases. And uh, it's, this is similar to Z3C, uh, Z3C JBot, the, the plone package that we use in plone development. And uh, yeah. it is possible to register custom routes. And what does a custom route mean? Uh, for example, um, if we look here, I'm. If I look here, right, he, uh, this one is content ID. That's not a root. Let me start. Um, Volto. Um, but a root would be like events slash edit. It would be um, control panel or something. So that's a separate. A component view that we register for a particular um, path in the browser. Um, okay. So, for example, if I go to site setup here, hold on a second just to reload to make sure everything is fine. You see, this one is that's not content. That's that's a root actually. The uh, the content paths are also um, loaded with the root, of course, because we have a router uh, in place. Um, we can provide custom Redux actions and reducers, and recently we are also able to provide middleware um, for Redux, and Redux will be used as uh, the global state, the global store. And uh, will be will allow us components to communicate uh, between each other. And this is uh, React. So of course we uh, we we have one-way data flow. Uh, pa parent uh, pass down props to children. The children are able to call functions from pass from the parent, but they will not be able to just change some value passed down and the parent will not be able to um, to to see that that value has been changed so we use redux to change data and to store this uh, global data uh, this is one of my favorites uh, register custom express middleware um, that that means uh, something like this and when we do this one yarn start it will actually start an HTTP server on localhost 3000. That HTTP server is the ExpressJS uh, framework. 
it's a really really pop popular um, node uh, uh, nodes uh, development frameworks. Uh, it provides the basic HTTP server. It provides uh, middle an extension mechanism called middleware. So we are able to register new uh, new extend new pages, new routes for that uh, um, HTTP server. That means, for example, uh, one of the use cases that we have um, is uh, a course proxy server, right? Or uh, some other, yeah. <laughs> some other uh, nice stuff. Um, we can tweak Webpack configuration. And this one is a really, really hard one because you, you have to uh, learn Webpack, uh, but usually in the, in, in the add-on development process, you don't really have to bother with this because uh, most of the setup for Webpack is already done by Volto. But for example, in case uh, that you want to, um, to, to load a Webpack plugin that's not supported, uh, I mean, that's not already provided by Volto, you are able to do that by um, writing an, a razzle.extend.js file inside your add-on. And this is, uh, of course, documented. Uh, so let's see, razzle.extend, you see? It is documented uh, in the documentation website. Uh, and uh, another one of my uh, favorites, or yeah, let's say pet peeves, is uh, an add on can provide a, a custom theme. So in, in the classic Volto um, tutorials, you see that the project is used as a theme. Um, so inside, if you want to customize CSS, if you want to customize components and so on, the project, the, the result of our, of our initial scaffolding will be, will be used as um, uh, to provide the custom theme. But actually it is possible to, uh, to use the, the um, add-on and to make it behave like a theme. And there are uh, plenty of examples, for example, in the EA, Repo. Uh, I think I should go to, let's say, uh, Volto IMS theme. If we look at this Razzle extend file that I've been, I've mentioned, this little uh, lines uh, make it possible so to override the theme folder so it makes it possible to treat this add-on as a separate theme. And that means that um, the, the Volto project that we just generated, it becomes throwaway. Um, the, the, the structure inside it, uh, the files that, that the scaffolding tool generate, you know, they may change in time. Um, you will we will develop new things, new practices. We will uh, we will arrive at the situation that we're gonna you're gonna see. Hey, if you have a Volta project, you have to migrate it, and you have to to do this or that inside your project to to update the the basic files up to the latest uh, um, standards. But if you move all your code in an add-on then it's the process uh, of upgrading becomes really easy because you're able to just say, okay, I'll just throw everything away except my package.json that contains my dependencies and uh, add-on projects and so on. I add on uh, loaded, Volto add on loaded and just start from scratch and nothing will be lost. And that's, that's a great thing. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, many, many things. <laughs> uh, the, the intention is to make add-ons as powerful as uh, the project. And as far as I know, today, that's 100% true. I don't, I don't know anything that uh, you can do in a Volto project directly and something uh, and you cannot do in an add-on. 
Uh, and of course, there's always the shadowing mechanism to override uh, a bottle um, file. Okay, moving on. Um, oh yeah, uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, and this is important. I didn't mention the the loading order of the configuration. Um, in our Volta project, if I'm editing the package.json here, I have I have this list, and the list is not just a bunch of things, but it's an ordered bunch of things. Right. So if I have another add on, I will list it below. Right. So let's say I, I, I will load Volto, I don't know, glossary and something else. Right. The order that, that they are listed here is important. This one will load first, then this one will load after the other one. And um, that that means that, for example, if you find that uh, you don't agree with what this add-on does, you can just, let's say this one is our uh, add-on that we care about. I, I can just put it last so that in my, in my add-on loader, I can just, let's say, fix the configuration. So um, whatever, whatever Volto Glossary did, I can just come in after that and, and fix it. And the registry configuration resolving order is like this. Uh, first, Volto declares its configuration registry. Then it uses all these add-ons declared here to modify that uh, configuration registry. And last, the Volto project comes in and it will, um, it will let's say, give you the last chance to fix everything but as i've mentioned i don't i, I don't really like to use the vault project for uh, things like that and i like to use um, add-ons um, it is also possible to load from an add-on some optional configuration and i mentioned here in when i was looking at at this uh, file i've mentioned that it is possible to export not just the default function, but also something else. So let's say function um, add extra things, right? And this is a configuration loader. And uh, just because why not, I'm using two, two different methods of uh, declaring functions, but they are equivalent. In here, we declare a constant that's equal to an anonymous function. But here we just declare the function. Okay, so now with this function declared here, we can go back into uh, our Volta project in the main package.json and we can say, actually let's, not, let's do it here, add extra thing or whatever that, yeah, things. Uh, so now Volto will, will load from our add-on, it will load the main um, load configuration loader, the one that's exported as default. And then it will load these, these other extra things. Now, here comes the cool part. <laughs> um, in your add-on, in the package.json, you can actually say that your add-on depends on other add-ons. So you can say uh, my add-on depends on, I don't know, Volto Slate or whatever other uh, add-on exists. And it can, it, it can de depend on uh, some profiles, uh, let's call them profiles, some additional configuration loaders from them. And they, they are all uh, resolved in a dependency, directed dependency graph. So, so basically there, there will be no conflicts. Uh, um, the, the dependency order will be resolved by Volto. Um, yeah, so that's it for loading an add-on. And uh, Okay, any questions?
comments so far? If not, then we move on. Yeah, just mention that you can have more than one profile as you do in the code as the fall block and simple link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are two. So for example, um, I'm I'm taking Volto Slate uh, because I'm more familiar with it. But if we look at the uh, index.js, so that's the main, we have this one, which is the default configuration profile, but we have something else, the minimal default, the simple links. So basically all of these are configuration loaders. You can, they are optional. You can choose to load them in your project or not. And because of the resolution order, because you can always add your um, add-on to the but to the end of that add-ons list, you have the chance to fix, to come back to 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 fix the configuration if you don't agree on what an add-on loads. Also, we are, we are calling it profiles. Yeah, we we knowingly map it. Uh, um, mimicking the uh, yeah. ZOP and the plone add-ons, uh, uh, I mean, the add-ons profiles, right, the generic setup. So we, we can willingly call it profiles okay. because of that. So you can think on them uh, same way. Yeah, I can hear uh, Eriko uh, talking. <laughs> he He's having uh, the Volto deployment tutorial. Even... Yes, it's uh, quite close here. <laughs> we are quite close here in Sorrento. Okay, cool, cool. Ah, too bad I'm not there. <laughs> okay, so um, continuing with uh, our um, tutorial, we're gonna do a basic block. And I mean, uh, this is more or less one of the uh, basic tasks that uh, we do with Vault. And uh, I'm always amazed that it is it goes so fast to create a new block. It's so nice. Okay. So um, our block is just just uh, a React component. So if I will create a new data table uh, block, and I, I will call it data table view dot j six, I I think that's uh, yeah that's no data table. So let me go and fix my path. Okay, so I have a folder called data table. Inside, I have a file called data table view. And uh, let's clean this up so that I can close it. Okay, so now uh, if you're wondering which file I have set up, I, I'm looking at, you can see here. And basically, if I switch between the files, the color which will change. So, the black black uh, background is uh, the file that's selected. But I, I will try to uh, always point to the file that I'm editing. Um, OK, so I need to pay. Oh, oops. Uh, I need to grab this code, which is just a simple, 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 the most basic React component. We always need to import React in our components. Uh, uh, maybe maybe when we uh, upgrade to Babel 7, not, that won't be needed anyway. And we export that component as a default. And that, that affects the way we will import it. But other than that, we could have exported from here as well. And our component only has uh, a simple div as its view and then we will do the same uh, for the edit component so a, a volta block has needs two components at least the view component and the edit component the view component will be used uh, in the let's say view page and the edit of course in the edit page um, the table edit six Okay, so this one uh, is mostly the same, except that we're importing the default export from the data table view. And I'm calling it the default export, but you have to realize that here you could have called it anything you want. <laughs> so, 
So now I put my, on the right side, I put the data table view um, module. So here I have it declared as data table view, but because I'm exporting as exporting it as the default, then in the other file, in the edit file, when I'm importing the default export from that module, I can name it any way I want. So just be aware of this, but it doesn't have to match. So in here, if I if I make the names match, it's gonna be fine. But usually just, just to avoid, you know, when you try to find something and by name and yeah, whatever, we try to keep the name consistent. So that means I'm gonna import the data table view and I'm gonna reuse it in the view uh, component. <coughs> okay, so uh, now that I have my components, I will probably need to register the new block. So inside here, inside the index.js, uh, hold on a second, and <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just used to switching screens. Oh yeah, uh, we're gonna do this step uh, immediately, but we need to add a new block. And um, this one, basically you can you can copy it from uh, the tutorial, you can find it in the, the documentation, but I really, really recommend that you keep the Volto source code close to you. Because I, just as well, I could have gone to my local copy of the Volto, uh, of Volto checkout, I could have gone to config blocks and go to the registration of the blocks, just copy one of these uh, block registrations into my uh, configuration. And yeah, that's, that's what I usually do. I go into uh, the source code of Volto and copy things from it. Okay, so, um, Uh, what do we do here? Uh, we are mutating the, the configuration and I see some um, code that looks like config equals and then config uh, just spreading and and just doing like this and, and so that's that's yeah. And, and so on and so on. That's, I don't know. It's just a, a bunch of noise. To me, it is simpler just to say, go in the config blocks, blocks config, and we're adding. So this one will be an object and we can uh, look for it here in the Volto. Let's call it this Volto or rather browse Volto. So we're, we're dealing with uh, this thing this object, which we can see it's an object and it has ID and then the block object configuration. So in the blocks config, we will basically monkey, monkey patch it or we will, <laughs> we will add new stuff inside it. Uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna add an object called data table. And this is important, make sure, and I've seen this happen, uh, while we develop, make sure that this ID matches this one. Uh, in case you have problems or you don't know why your uh, block is not showing up or it's not registered and so on, it is possible that you just, you, you don't have them uh, matching. So the data table registers a new block. Um, we have the title data, data table, we're gonna to need to import the, an SVG icon for it. And we're gonna to need to import the view components for it. Okay, so um, I will go and add the imports, right? So I will Im import uh, data table view, data table edit, and I'm gonna import them from the data table folder. Okay, right now, this is not possible. And you, you can see the linter uh, telling me that it's unable to resolve the path to mod module data table. And that happens because I don't have inside this folder, I don't have the index.js file. And here in the index.js, 
which I've opened on the right side, I need to export a data table view from the current path file, data table view, right? So this should work and I'm gonna export the data table edit from the data table edit uh, path, okay? So basically right now I'm editing index.js file and I'm just saying, hey, from this module, we're, ju we're just gonna export two, two names uh, that come as the default export from these modules. Okay, so you can see here that uh, the linter no longer complains. I'm gonna close the split not to make it confusing and I'm sorry about that. And now I've just saved and uh, Volto will crash, except yeah, it's not started, let's start it. Uh, actually, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's import the table SVG so that we have this module perfect. Start Volto. While loading, you can maybe mention about the um, omelet folder. Victor mentioned it in the Slack chat. Mm. Okay, yeah, I, I, now I, I, I saw the message. So uh, Victor is, is telling uh, us about the following fact. If I, if I go into uh, the Volta project, right? So I went up in the uh, directory hierarchy. You will see that I have no modules and inside it is a big, 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 big folder where I will find at plone. Inside it, I will find uh, Volto, right? But the Volto project, thankfully, sets up a symlink, this one. Uh, called omelet <laughs> and uh, there, there's a, a build out extension that does this uh, i'm not sure how yeah it, it's old and i'm not sure if it's still used uh, right now but uh, basically what it what that extension did was to create sim links for all um all egg python eggs to create sim links for them inside a folder so that they can be used uh, by uh, uh, by linter, for example, uh, to or by just uh, just to uh, browse code uh, for easy access, and this happens uh, inside the Volta project as well. So we have this link omelet omelet, and inside it, it is the Volta uh, source code. And it is the Volto source code that's used by our Volto. So that means that you can actually change it. Uh, and so for example, I can go here into blocks and I can, I can write a console log for blocks config and I'm gonna write uh, Volto as a string just to, to have it now. If I save, you will see here that uh, the code reloaded, uh, that's called the hot reload, and you can see my uh, console log uh, at top. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's how <laughs> the uh, blocks config um, looks like when logged into the um, console. And these are the SVGs. Nice. Okay, <clears throat> so let me get rid of this. Uh, not, it doesn't happen always that uh, the hot reload will take the Volto modif modifications. You may have to restart Volto, the Volto project just to take uh, the mod modification done inside Volto. Okay, so um, back into our project, sorry. Now, if I go, I can create a new page. Um, let me try to simplify this. Why it's so ugly? I don't know. Uh, and 
voila, we have uh, the, the block. Right now it does nothing, <laughs> but uh, that's a good start. So um, table here, it's the, it is uh, the view, the text here. So with that, we are able to select the block and we are able to edit it. Okay. Um, back to the tutorial. Um, we're gonna improve the block edit and we're gonna add uh, what Volta blocks usually do. I mean, they edit, edit their settings or their data in the sidebar on the right. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just take this code and I will drop it in the edit. So right now I'm in the table edit um, file, which is in the Volta project, in the add-ons, Volta data table, uh, source data table, data table edit. And jo just focus this on the, on the add-on. So here in the data table, uh, we need to replace and put the code from the tutorial. Okay, so um, we have some components that we need to uh, import. And <laughs> I should I should mention, and maybe uh, right now, I mean, maybe I should have mentioned it uh, at the beginning of the tutorial, but don't start developing for Volto or any anything, don't start developing unless you have a really good integration with the editor. Um, and my editor right now uh, is integrated with ESLint, which is the code linting tool that Volto uses. And ESLint uh, can tell us that, for example, this name, sidebar portal, is not defined. And um, yeah, basically we have to, we have to, um, important. If I save right now, you can see that another uh, in, uh, another integration is that my code was auto formatting, auto formatted, and that is done by the ESLint integration. So make sure, and I, I'm sorry, but I don't know uh, Visual Studio Code or any other uh, popular editors, but make sure that your editor is uh, properly integrated with, uh, with JavaScript editing and and with the ESLint configuration provided by uh, <coughs> Volto. <coughs> and Volto, <coughs> sorry, Volto provides that integration. You, you've seen, uh, I didn't have to do anything. Uh, by itself, it's already integrated with everything. And that is uh, thanks to this file that sits in the root of the Volta project, uh, which basically defines the ESLint configuration. Okay, so uh, back here, um, there are several imports. The sidebar portal, it comes from clone Volta components. And uh, so this is a module that exports most of the Volta's uh, components. So you will see a lot, like for example, yeah, we can add form, we can add field to it, but the segment, this one, it comes from semantic UI, import segment from semantic UI react. And if you find this name a little bit uh, hard to remember, you have to, <laughs> you have to remember that for them, semantic UI is the most important things and they put the React to the, to, to the end. Because sometimes uh, you will find the pack, JavaScript package name called like uh, React drop zone, let's say, or uh, React something, right? But in, in our case, uh, semantic UI is the CSS library and the, the React uh, integration is more or less uh, a side project. Okay, so, um, now, 
we are uh, reloaded, sorry, we can go to our data table um, project. Oh, oops. I will go here and if we edit, oops, I have to debug something. Probably I didn't uh, do the imports correctly uh, because yeah, let's uh, look. Okay, so uh, form is actually imported from Semantic UI React. That's my mistake. And that's why you should always follow the tutorial. Back here. Okay, so um, we have it running, that's good. Uh, so we have something in the sidebar. We, we have this uh, data table thing. Um, and this is a file, uh, I mean, this is a, let's say pick, um, object pick uh, widget. We, we can basically pick content from inside the um, inside Volto, inside uh, sorry inside plum uh, it's really basic and nothing happens but uh, it works so let's look back on, on what we've added and let me try to uh, place them side by side so we look at them okay so like like so. Okay. So sidebar portal, uh, that's kind of like a magical component that, that uh, basically will insert into the sidebar everything that we put here in, as a child of this component. So we put, uh, uh, we put a segment and it has uh, this uh, header a data table, this is this one. And inside it, we put a form and with a field. And uh, this field will be, we will call it file path. The widget will be object browser and the value will be something. Uh, and now we arrive at the concept of uh, fields and widgets. And I think this is uh, a really, really important uh, concept to, to master with, when developing Volto. Um, <clears throat> okay, so our block, our data table uh, edit component, it will receive some property props from uh, the Volto machinery. And for example, one of the prop is selected which we use here in the sidebar portal, it says, okay, don't use the sidebar portal unless this block is selected. So if that means if I go to the title block, I'm no longer seeing the content inside here. But if I, if I go to, um, if I go to, hold on a second, if I go to my table block, it will be, it, it will activate uh, the content of that block. Okay, and then um, we have form here is used strictly for uh, decorative uh, purposes. It is just used to make things nicer. So if I am saving it, yeah, you see the hot reload kicked in and it's updated the thing at my right, but it looks bad. So in our case, form just provides a wrapper with, uh, with styling. Now, the field. Um, the field is a Volto component and it's a wrapper on, on a widget. Basically, uh, it will have some, um, some algorithm where it will decide exactly which widget to to produce here to edit your field. And um, if you're familiar with dexterity schema, then 
you know, uh, or Zope schema or any other forms library, you will know immediately what, what this is about. So we have, we have some data, we want to edit that data with a, a particular widget. And in our case, that widget will be something called object browser. But this one, this key corresponds to, um, to the widgets uh, key in the Volto configuration registry. And we will look, uh, look at it right away. And then <clears throat> the value for this uh, field will be this one. Uh, and it will, it will have some props that it will pass down to the widget. Now, the widget selection algorithm, I think it's really, really important to, uh, to have a grasp on how it happens. And you can do that the easiest by looking in the Volto source code. So for example, if we go into components manage, uh, I think it's widgets and field. No, it will be in form here. Okay. So the path is uh, Volto components manage and then form and then field.j6. Okay, if you scroll down uh, to the component here, you will see that the widget is the one based on a bunch of things. And you can see that it's always with an or condition. So first it tries to get a widget by field ID. So that means that uh, in my case, I have this field ID. So I can register a custom widget for a particular field by the field ID, right? Uh, then it will try to make, to get it from the tag values and that is the widget options. And these, one, these ones, you can pass it down from, from um, the dexterity schema. So that means uh, if you have a dexterity content type, uh, you can set in the schema particular uh, hints for um, for the widget machinery inside Volto on what widget exactly to use. And for example, we have a, a geo tags widget, right? Um, and we want to use that for particular uh, type of field. And that one, we deduce that based on information coming from here. Then it's gonna try to do get widget by name. Right, so it, it says props widget, and that is our key here. So when we pass down widget here as a prop to the field component, and we say object browser, it will get in here in the field component in Volto, it will match this one props widget. And because uh, what will happen will be true-ish, it will stop and not go further. But if we go further, uh, we see that it can, it can get the widget by having available choices, or we can define the vocabulary as a prop, or uh, a factory, or a type. And the final is the widget default, which is just a simple text with, uh, input. But we said object browser here, right? So now if we go to the... Um, Volto configuration registry. So I'm here in Volto config widgets.j6, open it. And we had, we, uh, we had get widget by name. So this one you see, it looks in config widgets, widget by widget name. So that will be config uh, widgets widget and then object browser this one object browser widget so it's it's no mystery it's very very straightforward to understand what you need to do to register new widgets how to um, register them and how to reference them uh, from schemas and we are dealing with client-side schemas not dexterity schemas we don't have a content type we're just developing a voltable 
Okay. Um, the, the widget protocol implies two main things, and that is the value and an on-change property. This one will be a callback that happens when the, the widget decides that it has changed its value. So in our case, right, we have we are passing down uh, this uh, anonymous function here. This one, so the on-change callback that we pass down to widgets is the uh, it is a function with signature ID and value. And uh, it, it needs to do something. So when the field changes, uh, our function will be called with ID and the value. So basically the ID would probably be this one that we pass here. And the value will be whatever value we enter in the widget. And then we can do something and that is we will call our own change block. So, so that's another prop that's passed down from above. And that allows us to change the values of our block. So we will call our on change block it, again with an ID, and that's our block ID. We uh, destructure our existing block data, and we are going to say that uh, in this data, we will put a new value. We don't know the name, but we know uh, what we have this ID variable referencing that name and uh, we set the value. Uh, <clears throat> Can you add a console log for block data before the return? This way we also see what they contain in the sure. browser console. Sure, sure, okay. <coughs> okay, so we can add the console log, right? And I do that and the print or console log is the programmer's best friend. But we're going to also uh, see what other ways of uh, debugging we have uh, with React. OK. <clears throat> so if I look at the console, uh, you can see my, my block data. Block, always, block values always have this type. The, the, block type and our file path right now is empty but if we would pick something our file path now will be an array and that array um, contains data coming from uh, my object that i have uh, just selected and uh, just to see how responsive this is if i just erase it then the file path will no longer be there. Now, um, actually, and I, now I'm going to enter unknown territory because I haven't. Uh, oh, I do. Okay. Uh, actually, we have uh, the uh, React development developer um, extension, so you can go to components here, and you can. So there are two pickers. One above that's uh, the DOM element here and the one from below this one you can just go into any component you see and we have it data table view here and uh, data table edit here and um, inside it we can check whatever it got as props right so everything that I would have console logged is also here. So it gets the data right here. So if I pick something here, yeah, let's, uh, oh, why, why, why don't you uh, update? Let's see. You see, now I have, uh, I have uh, the new value. And uh, yeah, that's that's a, I mean, familiarize yourself with this uh, extension because it's great, but don't feel shy to use uh, console log. It, it works just as well. Um, both of them, use them. Okay, so <clears throat> um, 
this process of adding new fields uh, will really, really soon become uh, pretty tedious. I mean, we, uh, I don't want, I, you, you saw uh, the amount of controls that uh, we had in the beginning uh, when I sh I've shown the block. There were a lot of controls uh, that we have, many, many fields. We won't uh, actually um, continue with this type of uh, development where we set the field manually like this, but I, I wanted you to understand um, what exactly is a widget and um, what, how you can manipulate that because that is the key uh, to, to your future development. You will have to develop new widgets. It's really easy to develop them. And uh, I think, I think I, I'm not, yeah, I, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna actually develop a widget uh, on our own here in this training. And uh, yeah, they are great. Don't don't uh, be afraid to to do that as well. Okay, so uh, to continue, um, so far I've just picked something random uh, from my uh, from my plot, but we will need a real CSV file to use in the data table, and the tutorial provides this one. So in chapter one, add-on basic. Actually, it's here. It's uh, Volto Addons development. So it's chapter two. Don't don't go by the URL because it's a mistake. Um, there's this note at the bottom, and there's a link. Click on it. You get uh, a file for estaria.csv. And if we look at that file a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, it's open uh, the second time on my screen because I have it already open. It's just a file. I mean, it's not really huge. Uh, it's some random statistics that I had on my computer. Um, but yeah, just a CSV file. <clears throat> uh, you should download it in case you want to play and follow along with the tutorial. Okay. So, um, <coughs> um, hydration break. Um, we will continue to add uh, less files uh, and we will style basically our add-on with a less file. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, today, in this day, this uh, this the fact that we can use less files in add-ons, it's it's very uh, mundane. It's it's nothing fancy, nothing uh, special about it. But uh, at the time when uh, this uh, this tutorial was initially written, it was quite a <laughs> quite a feat, quite a feature. Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy the content of, in this file. I will add source data table data table edit dot less file, right? So back in my editor, I have to data table less, no, data table dot less. Okay, so I've just created this file and I'm gonna paste the content. Okay, now, this, what, what we have here is um, a less, which is you know a superset of uh, of CSS. We have a less file that integrates with the semantic UI theme that's uh, provided by uh, Volto. And to be able to do that, we have to declare a type and an element. And for add-ons, we uh, we usually use type extra and whatever element you want, but custom will be just fine. And I'm hoping I'm not making a mistake because. This is complicated. I like I like for us to uh, at some point simplify this. Uh, just just do it like this, and you won't have problems. Then we have this import multiple thing config, and this is um, like the 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 key feature that makes semantic UI theming work. And this one uh, basically by by declaring this uh, variables less variables inside theme config, it will do a bunch of other imports based on what is here. And it will try to find the, 
uh, extra dot overrides and extra dot whatever. But, but by doing so, we have access to variables that are provided by Volto. So we could have said probably primary color or whatever uh, it's used in Volto. This is just a really, really light example of how uh, you might use less files in Volto. And my brother David should probably at some point offer to do a training on uh, Volto semantic UI theming. Okay, so um, we have the less file. And if I go to, actually, I will go to data table view because that would be the proper place to import it. So I'm going to say import data table dot less. And notice I'm not importing anything from that for file. Um, it is imported for side effect. So basically, there are two, two types of imports. Uh, one where we import uh, a JavaScript object from it. And uh, this one is just for side effects. The fact that uh, by doing so, it will be picked up by Webpack uh, machinery and it will, uh, it will result in some CSS being loaded in our project. So <clears throat> uh, let's see, because we, we, I haven't actually looked at what that less file uh, con contained. Oh, this is data table edit. I should have just, uh, I actually will leave it in the data table uh, view because we are already loading that component. So uh, we are saying here that uh, a block called data table edit will have a form uh, element, but we don't have it uh, so far. So we need to con continue with uh, uh, with our um, tutorial. Okay, so I'm gonna take this bunch of code and drop it in the data table edit. And I'm not gonna try to, uh, although we might be able, so basically, this part was added, uh, but there were some, some changes here as well where we have a fall, fallback. And I think, yeah, we've added this class name uh, to the component. <coughs> but um, yeah, let's just copy paste this and keep ourselves out of troubles. Oops, something wrong. Okay, so what are we missing? We're missing icon and uh, table SVG. So we have table SVG, we have it here. And the icon is imported from Volto components. Now, uh, there, are, there are, you're actually gonna uh, encounter many times uh, two components, one from, one coming from semantic, two icon components, sorry, one coming from semantic UI React and one coming from Volto. The Volto component, uh, basically you have to pass it an SVG uh, file, like uh, an SVG component like that. So if we look, for example, at this one, you see icon name is table SVG, but the table SVG here, it will actually be a table, uh, the, the SVG file content. Okay, so uh, what do we have? Uh, let's, let's first see it in the browser. Okay, so <clears throat> we have, um, a nicer default view for uh, for the um, for the block. So what do we do inside? Um, first of all, we have this condition. So, uh, and we saw that the file path is an array, right? So, um, if what what we're saying here is that if the array length is zero then we're going to show this. Otherwise, we're going to show uh, this. 
No, uh, so this one, is, if the array uh, length is basically high, um, bigger than zero, so if I, if I uh, take the negation from, uh, from the beginning, um, so, <clears throat> um, and uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, this symbol, the, the question mark symbol here. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this, this one will wrap data inside, inside um, let's say, safety provider <laughs> uh, structure. In case, in case a file path doesn't actually exist inside uh, data, it will be provided as a, as a sort of fallback object. And that fallback object will have, for example, length. And because it knows that it replaces something that would be a real object, uh, that length will be zero, of course, because in case that, in case file path is missing, you don't actually want uh, um, the length to be bigger than zero. Uh, but for example, if this one will would would be missing, what would happen is that. So let me save it. <clears throat> and um, go to data table, delete it. Yeah, it will crash all the time. And it will crash with an error that says, let's see, cannot read properties of undefined reading length. Okay, so what, what, did, you, what did we do? In data, so in data, our file path was undefined because we were trying to read length from, from undefined. Now we can avoid that problem by wrapping by, by adding this question mark. So that makes it safe. That makes it uh, the alternative would have been to say data file path and so this one is safe as well, right? But it's not, uh, hold on a second. It's not as short and, and the code is less readable. I mean, we we're adding a, a lot of extra characters. And if you have, for example, uh, if you have deep objects, uh, object within object within object and so on, uh, that code will look really, really ugly. So it's a lot easier just to add this uh, question mark character here, and then all things will be uh, safe. Okay, so um, <coughs> um, okay, let me uh, put things on the screen back again. Um, <laughs> and um, more down below, and basically we have, um, we are treating two cases. Um, we have the sidebar portal and that controls what is on the side. And then we have the other part, which, which is the main part of the block here. <clears throat> and uh, basically what happens is when we pick a file, it, it's gonna change here, but also uh, at the right side. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we will do a, a break in five minutes. So let's see what else we can do in those five minutes. 
Okay, so first of all, I should upload uh, my file. The forest area, and I should pick that file and I should save. Okay, so um, next, uh, we're gonna have to fetch data for this block, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, let's let's uh, expose on this. Um, if we look, I mean, what what will happen is that our data will be fetched in an AJAX call and it will come and it will populate our table. And there are multiple ways to do that. And, and it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, if, we, if, for example, for you, it is important to have that data in the, in the moment the block renders at uh, server-side rendering, you will probably choose a different uh, path. You will not load the data inside the, the block. You will uh, try to make sure that, or you would, you would uh, basically have to add an additional mechanism to, to make sure that the data is included with the block uh, when the block is already rendered. Because our data will come uh, will come based on code that executes in the browser uh, that is triggered by the rendering of the component. And uh, of course, uh, there is the React uh, component lifecycle and how they render and how uh, the, the data, the use effect hooks executes and so on. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's too much. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think we will be able to discuss it in this training. But uh, if you want to go quickly through that, I can I can do that. <clears throat> okay. Um, there is there is a mechanism uh, in Plone uh, REST API called uh, uh, block transformers, and that means that uh, when you save the block in in Plow. Uh, when the, that block goes into the ZODB database, uh, it will go through a transformer that, that will take the data and in the deserialization process, it will be able to mutate that data. So for example, why we might want to do that, uh, we might have uh, URLs like, uh, or you've seen that the object that was picked uh, by the object browser, uh, we might have URLs and they, uh, when they are stored in ZODB, they are converted to resolve UIDs. So that in case uh, the destination uh, content moves, is moved or whatever, uh, the resolve UID is updated to the new location of that. Uh, I mean, not the resolve UID, but when we serialize that uh, that block data, so deserializes when we save the block, serializes when we load the block and look at it in the view page. So when we lo load that uh, block in the serialization, the transform the serialization transformer goes in and it it changes that value. It's it picks up the fact that it's a resolve UID value. It, it changes it and it will. Uh, transform it in an absolute URL so that we can uh, have the updated path in the browser. Uh, there are many, many, many use cases for the transformers. And um, un let's say, unfortunately, but uh, that's, I mean, that's what it is. Uh, it means that you can do, let's say 19, 90%, 95% of all the development, you can do it in React but you will have to do probably also some uh, backend uh, development also in Plone. Um, but the good, I mean, the bright side is that uh, React, I mean, if you, if you work in a team, um, React developers are a lot more uh, easy to find than uh, Plone backend developers. 
Okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, let's do a break. Uh, we'll uh, meet each other again in five minutes. Um, my voice is uh, is really starting to feel the two hours uh, non-stop speaking. So let's uh, continue at uh, six, uh, five past, no, ten. Hi, everybody. I'm back. So I'll just assume everybody is back and I hope you are back, everybody. Um, <clears throat> we will continue with, uh, with writing uh, a data fetching procedure uh, in the client side. And um, for that, we will use Redux and we will uh, write a new action and the reducer pair so that we integrate with uh, Redux. And uh, I have some uh, suggestion on uh, showing you exactly where to look up uh, for the block transformation uh, information. So uh, plon REST API. Tiberio. Yes. Share your screen. Right oh. now we see your face full screen. Okay. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Do you see my screen? <coughs> All okay with my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, in the Plon REST API documentation, uh, there is a section called uh, Voltoblox support. And here uh, we will see uh, blocks serializers and deserializer. And a transformer is basically an adapter. Uh, actually, it's a subscription adapter because you can, uh, <clears throat> if it would be a, a single adapter uh, registered for this, you will have conflicts and so on. But we actually want to register multiple adapters <clears throat> and uh, it's a class it has uh, kind of like this signature it it will get uh, the context and the request uh, in the in in the initializer and then when it is called it gets the value and mm, the the basic structure for the deserializer and the serializer is the same uh, basically the deserializer transforms the value coming from the browser. It trans transforms it to a value fit to be stored in the database. And the serializer does the counterpart. Basically, it takes the value coming from the database and it makes it suitable for uh, the browser. And <clears throat> um, you, have to, you have to add this block type uh, attribute. And that means uh, that this um, this tra block transformer applies to to Volto blocks that have the a round type image. So basically, uh, if we will have a block, and I'm writing on the left side with with type image and whatever data, and then we'll have your URL something, right? For this value, this uh, uh, this uh, transformer will uh, will apply. It is possible to also uh, set the block type as none, and that means that this serialize uh, this transformer applies to all blocks. So that makes it possible to create the so-called uh, smart fields or whatever. <clears throat> so basically, you will get the block value. And it's up to you, whatever, it's up to, let's say, the, this adapter, what it tries to find inside. Um, because it will apply to all blocks. So that means, for example, 
uh, our block can declare uh, something like uh, uh, the uh, just just a random uh, key and value and we could have but there is no such thing but we could have uh, a transformer that looks for block value keys that start with underscore v underscore and we will would um, implement the the, the zero db protocol that values that start with underscore v underscore are not saved to the database so yeah that that would be one way to use a, a smart field or we could say hey all absolutely all uh, your fields that are called url they're going to be processed with the resolve uid uh, uh, transformation thing and and so on or I could, I could imagine, for example, that we push data uh, as the block value of coming from the browser, but we push, let's say, something like uh, binary data, and it's going to be a bunch of things. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it could be uh, base64 encoded or whatever. You make sure that you, you can put it in a JSON. And on the backend side, you take this data, you transform it to a real file inside the ZODB, and you replace this binary data inside the block value, right? Because at that moment you're in the backend, you could replace it with URL and uh, let's say the path to that file that you have created. So it's a really, really powerful uh, concept and unfortunately uh, not 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 enough used let's say in Volto it should be more used okay um, back to our uh, tutorial <clears throat> let's uh, let's skip this part uh, with the changes to the block and let's start with uh, creating and adding the new action reducer pair. And so, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, it's really hard to explain Redux uh, as a side note in a training, but uh, Redux is that global state uh, and uh, it implements the one-way data flow uh, that uh, React promotes. And uh, I think it's, it was initially called Flex, the package that implemented that that flow. Uh, so to be able to mutate the data in the global store, you call an action. And in that action, so uh, we would have this uh, function. Get, in our case, we call it get row content. This function, we can pass whatever parameters we decide. And it needs to return an object with, uh, so basically this one would be the action it needs to return an object that represents our action and the object needs to, so it needs to have an action type and then whatever we decide that we need as an extra information in that action so then this action is executed by redux i mean it's intercepted by the redux middleware and it's used to change the global store and that change is being performed by another action another uh, function which is the so-called reducer so this one it it gets the the, the previous state as a, as a parameter this one it gets the, the action that we have sent so it's this object and inside, it needs to return the state modified, what, whatever, uh, however we, we decide that we uh, will change the state uh, for, that, uh, uh, for that particular case. Uh, and I'm going to also show you how to, um, how to debug, let's say, this Redux uh, um, actions and store. 
So uh, the convention is to use a, a constant for the action type. And uh, we, <coughs> sorry, we will place, uh, place that uh, constant in a file. And uh, just to, uh, yeah, well, whatever. Um, trust me, I am not sick with whatever pandemic is these circling these days and just, yeah. Constants, okay, we've declared uh, this um, constant. We put it in the constants module file. This one sits in the root of our add-on, right? So it's not in the data table folder. It is located in the source folder of the Volta data table uh, uh, add-on. So in constants, <coughs> we are exporting um, this get, get row content constant. And we will also create uh, the actions module and I'll put the action here. And um, if you if you browse uh, <coughs> if you browse the Volto uh, repository inside um, inside Volto, you will see actions, and inside actions, you will see one folder for each of the actions. For the purposes of this tutorial, we'll keep it simple. Uh, we won't replicate the folder uh, setup, but basically it's just namespaces uh, and, and, and folders and paths, nothing fancy. In the end, they all, uh, they all get imported in here. In, so basically, uh, this one will become kind of like the actions uh, module inside Volto. <clears throat> so because all of them, uh, from this folder will be imported and then uh, exported. Okay, so uh, we have this action. What do we do? We need the type uh, that we have imported and the type is just, hold on a second, the type is just a simple string. So now, now I'm looking at the constants file. Okay, uh, and so let me close go back to actions. So now I'm in the actions. I have the action, it exports a type uh, and we define something and that would be, we say, I want to, I want to do a request uh, and the request will be based on, on the parameters that were passed to the function. <clears throat> now, Volto treats actions that have this request key uh, in a magical way, in the sense that uh, they will actually be uh, executed by a special middleware, and they will uh, um, they will cause a network fetch, and we're gonna uh, check immediately and see what happens. Uh, so it will do a request of type get. So you could you could you could have here post for example or put or delete or whatever HTTP verb you want. It will have the, the path and the headers, and um, we're gonna stash the URL in action because the request um, won't be preserved. And um, yeah. Let's uh, let's continue, and we have to write the reducer. So we put the reducer here. Okay, so <clears throat> this is uh, a function called raw data. And uh, this name, the, the name that we use here, is going to be the name for the key in the global store. So basically, you can imagine the global Redux store as a big object. It's going to have a lot of keys. And for each key, we'll have a particular state. And that state will be whatever uh, its 
determined by executing this uh, reducer function. And <clears throat> yeah, um, let me put them side by side so that you can notice something. <clears throat> So I have I have uh, the action on the left and the reducer on the right. So I'm I'm looking at an action called get raw content and with uh, the type get raw content. But here, uh, when we do a switch on the action type, we see some action types that we didn't declare. And that is uh, from the from Volto's API middleware, the, 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 the let's say network API fetching middleware. This uh, this middleware invents and and actually triggers new types of fun functions based on the request. And we can uh, look at uh, its source code. Uh, actually, I think it's linked here. And that is good. <clears throat> so this middleware, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta, we can look at it. This is this is the signature for a Redux store middleware. And, and not not the object of this tutorial, but you can see that uh, it will it will, for example. Um, trigger a new action where the type is type pending. So uh, if I look at if I look at uh, my reducer, we will see that we are uh, handling an action called something pending, and then it will have in case of uh, success. Uh, ta -ta -da. So it will have actions, no, this one. It will have action success and it will have probably action failure. No, this one, it will, you see it will trigger a new type, one new action with type, type, which is get raw content, the, uh, underscore fail. So these new actions, although action types. Although we didn't declare them, we have to process them because they will be triggered by uh, Volto network fetching machinery. Um, so uh, let's uh, put the code in uh, use and then we can uh, really, really um, play around uh, with and see how to debug it and so on. Okay. So uh, now that we have the two, mo two modules, we have to uh, register the reducer. And we do that back in, uh, back in uh, the add-on configuration module. So I'm going to, uh, into Volta data table source index.js, right? So this, uh, this file was the one where we've added the block configuration. So now I can do that. Uh, I can I can add uh, this line either here or I can add it here. It doesn't matter. It's it's up to you how you want to organize uh, the content of this file. But we have we have to import it uh, the raw data. Uh, so. Um, we've now imported the reducer and we've added the reducer to the add-on reducers. Uh, <coughs> so now Redux will know that uh, you will have a new uh, key inside the global store and that key is called raw data. And um, let's see, do we have Redux? Yeah, we do. Okay, so um, what I have here is, let's uh, put it to the bottom. No, that is crazy. Let's put it to the side. 
Okay, I, I need it to dock actually, and I don't need it to go wild on the screen. And uh, close. <clears throat> Uh, oh well, we'll look at it like this. Try not to uh, to break too much. Okay. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> in here, in this uh, extension, you can see all the all the actions as they are executed, and you can actually da -da 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 -da, go back and. You can you can see this the the screen changes in in the back and that is like you can just travel back in time back and forth as the actions are executed to see how the how uh, uh, the state for our react application uh, changed and each action will uh, will have some data inside it and you can uh, you can check uh, what the action contained, and you can look at this global state. And this is what we're actually looking for, uh, because in the global state, we'll we'll have now this new raw data key. Right now it's empty because we we haven't uh, really triggered any action uh, to to change what's inside, but. Um, it is here and it's proper, properly registered. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly double check. Yeah, uh, we still have to do the changes inside, uh, inside the data table view module. So basically what we want is when we look at the block, right? If I'm in, if I'm in the view, and uh, let's check if, because, right, uh, we want to look at the components and we want to look at this component, the data table view, and this component has the fire path uh, saved. So we are actually ready to already use this file path and fetch the, fetch the data that sits there and put it on the screen. And uh, we needed the action, we have the action, let's do that now. Um, so <clears throat> I'll uh, quickly grab the code from here and I'll, I'll also explain it. Okay, uh, so and um, just to simplify and let me focus because I don't like or seeing red on my screen, uh, I'll also grab the imports. Okay, so now we have a little bit of uh, uh, destruction, but inner, so in the props, we will have a key uh, and we, Basically, what we are doing is const data data equal props, and uh, what we are actually doing is const data is props dot data. So basically, just assigning a new constant with the name data, but is equal to the value of the key uh, uh, the 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 lookup key from props called data. Uh, and then we are further destructuring that uh, data object because we are interested in um, in defining a constant called file path. So constant file path is actually props data file path, right? <coughs> okay. So then um, now we are looking for an ID. Uh, that that would be that that would be so let me <clears throat> quickly go back to this one in the file path you see that uh, it's an array so we'll have to look the the first entry in that array 
And that array will be an object. And in that object, it will have uh, a round ID, which will be basically the path for our uh, file. So uh, then <clears throat> now that we have it and um, be aware that again, I have used the question mark to make it safe to dig inside uh, the, um, this data structure. And again, you see, I'm using the question mark to further step down inside uh, that, that fail safe object to look for an ID key. And this ID right now could be or could be not. Like I could have something in the, in the array, I could have something in the file path, I don't know, but uh, it, it will be safe for me to handle it and uh, the, the browser will not uh, break. I mean, it, it won't uh, crash with an error. Uh, so now we are defining the path <clears throat> and that path is if I have the ID, right? We are using the ternary operator. So if I have the ID, I'm gonna do a string templating with the ID and then the download at that download uh, blown view. Otherwise it's gonna be still null. <clears throat> okay, so now we come to the interesting part, which is the Redux. And uh, this, is the re um, this is the Redux React hook. Uh, with it, we, uh, we can get the dispatch um, function. Um, that dispatch is a special method that uh, when we pass it the action, it will connect it to the Redux store. And um, this is more or less a new modern API to interact with uh, React. In Volto, you will um, find many, many cases where the old style of API is used. So uh, let me show you. <clears throat> For example, if I look at uh, manage edit, just j6 yeah you will see here connect and um, I mean I shouldn't go here maybe 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 go to breadcrumbs yeah that's that's a more safe and simpler component okay. So this one, connect, uh, it will connect uh, our component. It will wrap our component in, in something that will connect it and inject properties to it. So this one, connect, it's, it will uh, get a function. That function will receive the React global state. And from that function, we have to return a new object uh, we, we put everything, I mean, we put anything we want in that object and we can use the, the state that we receive and that state is the whole global uh, react, the, the whole global Redux state. So from that state, we are looking at the breadcrumbs key and that one will, will have an items key. So for example, if we look here in the Redux uh, developer extension, we should see breadcrumbs and that breadcrumbs should have an items uh, key, right? So basically that one just picked this array and, uh, and it puts it in this object and this object uh, is um, the, con the, the, the keys of this object are injected as uh, props to the component. So for example, if we will look for root here, you see, this props root uh, because what, whatever is injected here, it will become a property. And this one uses the, the old class style. So this props root and uh, the items will also be uh, a prop. And then of course, the, uh, we will have the actions. They will also be props. And you see here, get breadcrumbs from here. Uh, it's, it's an action, it's imported from Volta actions. 
but when it is used, it's not used directly from here, but it's, it's the one that's coming as a prop. So you see these props get breadcrumbs. And this one is basically wrapped inside uh, the dispatch that we use directly here. So uh, <clears throat> you can see here we pass the action as a as a uh, option to this connect um, function, and what we will get we will get it as a prop to the component. And when we use the action, we have to use the prop. But here in our uh, component on the left, we use the new style. We use dispatch. I mean, we get dispatch and with dispatch, we are able to use, uh, to use it directly. So we're no longer connect and get it from, a, get it as a prop or whatever, okay? So <clears throat> um, we have a dispatch. Then we have the use selector. And this one, the use selector is mostly equivalent to our case here at the right. So we get the state. So it is a function, we get the state. And from that state, we return whatever we are interested in. So just like here, we, we return, but because here we, we had to define a new object with keys and so on and so on. Uh, in our case, it is simpler because we, we are just interested in one value and that value is binded to a constant here. Okay, <clears throat> so what do we do? Um, we use this selector to look up state in the Redux store. We will call that state re request and that request should have data because that's uh, how Volto API works. It will, <coughs> it will store the downloaded content inside data and we will define um, a boolean that that is that says has data is do I have something in content true or false right and that is what the double um, asterisk the double um, shouting uh, mark uh, does okay so here comes the interesting part uh, the React use effect so that is. As, a, as an effect of our rendering the component, and that is rendering, um, let's say, and mounting it on in real DOM on the screen, something happens. And that something is, if I have path and I don't have data, I'm gonna dispatch the action. And that action will get the URL, that is the path that I have extracted from here. And basically, I, uh, you see, I, I have a condition path, right? So it is safe to say I will have a path here. And that's going to be uh, uh, something uh, with a value. And a React use effect, and I'm going to just delete clear this and you will see what happens, uh, is going to complain. Uh, this one is the extra parameter to the use effect. So the first, the first uh, parameter to this function, to the use effect uh, hook, is a callable a function. The second parameter, the second argument is um, the, let's say, action dependencies. Whatever I list inside, so for example, if I don't, uh, inside I'm using path has data, uh, and and uh, dispatch, right? This one. So I have to I have to list them all as dependencies, and uh, the magic thing happens here. So for example, if path is changed, then this whole thing is rerun. So uh, you can if you change from outside the path, it will just. Uh, be called back again, this whole uh, code, because the use selector basically um, adds a subscription of this component so that it will be refreshed whenever the global state uh, and the state raw data changes. 
<clears throat> so uh, with with this, it's pretty magical and, and simple to just keep the uh, component up to date whenever um, whenever we change, for example, the path. <clears throat> so um, with this, so basically the dependence here, see here, uh, says uh, tell React okay. In case any of this uh, object changes, you have to rerun this code. Okay, okay. So it reloaded, and let's uh, let's take a look and look at the network. And hopefully see a network call. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, just to to show that uh, this network call just didn't happen before, I'm gonna just comment this. So you see calls, clear it up, just, okay. Uh, and this one, and it is uh, our path and it, it has our file content. With that file content, we are now ready to uh, show it as a table on the screen. And step into the tutorial, next step. <clears throat> we did this, we did this, uh, we did this. We are, <clears throat> um, we are ready to go into this. Um, in here, uh, in the tutorial, we add the pop-up-ars uh, dependency. And you see, uh, again, the uh, yarn workspaces command that, uh, that I've executed uh, initially, yarn workspaces info. Um, you have to realize, for example, I, uh, with, with, the, with this command, you basically add the dependency in a particular workspace uh, package in our atom. But you, you can add the dependency also to the Volto project itself. So I can add, for example, I don't know, something uh, React color, right? Um, and it will complain because it says you cannot add the dependency to the workspace root because now it's a, basically it's, uh, Yarn knows that we are uh, dealing with multiple workspaces unless we add this uh, minus W flag. So I would have to go back and add the minus W flag. And then it will uh, add that dependency. Uh, and with it, it added the all, all the other dependencies and so on and so on. And so on. <clears throat> uh, one, one important thing, if we are still here, uh, the yarn log file, you should uh, commit this to whatever um, um, code uh, repository you use um, to GitHub or whatever. <clears throat> it belongs to a project. It doesn't belong to the add-on. You shouldn't, you should not uh, commit this file. If you have it somehow in an, in an add-on, you should not uh, commit it there. You should not add it. It doesn't. It doesn't belong in libraries. Only in uh, Node.js applications. Okay. So now that we've added, let's just also remove it. Yeah, I wish, I wish you would have shown where that was added before you removed it. Uh, maybe with the uh, Yarn workspace info or in which package JSON was added. Uh, I don't know. <coughs> um, it, it would, it would. <coughs> Sorry. 
<clears throat> it would have added to the uh, to, to the project root no no modules but um stay focused okay so what do we have here <clears throat> we've added the top of ours and that one um it's a csv parser it it is one of the few that run csv parsing in the browser there are a lot of CSV file uh, file parsers, node-based uh, CSV file parsers. And uh, yeah, you can have huge CSV files. So it's it's not a simple task. Um, but and this, uh, this package basically works with uh, CSV file parsing in the browser. So uh, what do we have extra? We have this one. So uh, now that um, <clears throat> with this one, we make sure that our um, request, right? Uh, and then our request will be populated with the result of whatever is in Redux at raw data. And then that um, we will, uh, have from that request, we will have defined the content data, otherwise it will be uh, undefined, right? And then once we have all of that, so we, we have this condition, if the data has been downloaded, because you, you have to take into account the fact that uh, our block will be rendered and re-rendered and re-rendered and, and so on many, many times, whenever something happens in, in this block. In some cases, some uh, some of this refreshing and re-rendering will be done uh, based on asynchronous conditions. So you could have uh, some variable defined that's uh, you that's using data coming from one of the hooks, and inside that same component, you will have some other variables that is going to depend on async data from other hook, and then you will have to basically check and match and see if you get all the data and be able to uh, to show this uh, block in multiple cases. If I have only one data or if I have all the data and so on. Um, okay, so <clears throat> let me copy the CSV import. Okay, and we will, um, let's just, console of the file data and just to see because you see const res is csv parse content and so on and we're we say the file data is react use memo okay so that means that our um, our function our, our component is basically a function you see here and that function i've just mentioned that it will <coughs> it will uh, re-render, it will refresh, rerun, rerun, rerun. So that means that this function will execute multiple times. Uh, so if I, if for example, I have this uh, variable defined here, this one will, will always, let's say, be redefined whenever the code runs. But in case we have costly functions and this one is like a really simple uh, variable definition. We're we're just we'll just we're just looking up some uh, values inside uh, two two levels deep object. But in case we have costly functions like this uh, CSV uh, parsing operation, we want to not do that all the time, right? So if you're familiar with the React use state uh, hook, which is the most basic one. Uh, and that ensures that the state uh, is preserved whenever this component function reruns. Um, the, the use memo basically is ensuring that whatever constant we're, whatever variable we, we're defining here, it keeps its value unless that, uh, that dependency variable changes. So basically whenever content will change, the file data will be refreshed because 
the function inside the use memo will be rerun. Um, okay, so let's see the file data in the browser. So if I look at the console, yeah, that, that is my data. So this one, it's, it's looking like this. Uh, so Papa Parse will create an object with some keys, the data key, the meta key, and the errors. And yeah, it seems that I have some errors. It doesn't matter. I have data inside uh, my, uh, my object. <coughs> And I have some uh, meta information about uh, the CSV file. Most importantly, most importantly, I have uh, the array with the fields that were inside. And that, that array is basically the headers of my CSV file. Um, and we will use them as uh, table headers. <clears throat> and that is happening be because I have passed here the header through option to the uh, CSV Papa uh, parse operation. Cool. <clears throat> Any questions or something that's not uh, clear? No? Okay. Moving on. <clears throat> now we get to uh, the nice part. So, <clears throat> oops. Um, hold on a second, because I'm a little bit lost. Okay. <clears throat> so we have this bit of code you saw just before uh, that meta. So in the file data, which is the object that I've logged, we will have the meta key and that will have the fields, which will be either an array or um, an empty list. And now this is something that's really interested uh, about JavaScript if you're a Python programmer. And that is, oh, sorry. Uh, the fact that an array is is true in a node, even if the, the array is uh, empty, which is not the case in Python. So if I say, for example, x and uh, is not empty, right? So that would be true and true. It is, right? So uh, x, uh, I mean, the array, the empty array, Ignoring the fa fact that it's empty, it's still Boolean true. Uh, <clears throat> so if we want to check if this array is empty, we have to do x length. And this time it will give us zero. And that's something else that you have to be aware that the result of this operation is zero, more or less, you can use it as a Boolean, but if you use it to render a component, if you use it in the in the GS, JS6 part of, the, of uh, your components, sometimes you will get zero rendered on the screen and you don't want that. So um, we will use this case, like with the ternary operator, right? So that we can just render nothing or we can just say, no, which again would be ignored by a React when rendering. Okay. So uh, again, we have uh, the array with fields. So basically we covered the fallback cases. If, if there's file data, if there's meta inside, and if we have fields, it's going to be an array. It can be empty. It can have something but in any case we have to uh, make sure that we also have the fallback. And then we will have the nice part. We will have a table displayed. So we'll replace this part. Let me scroll. And 
I think I took too much. So basically, just like before, when I, I've shown that we have to <coughs> we have to make sure that if we have file data, we render something. Uh, otherwise, we, re we render the fallback. We use the ternary operator here to see if we have a file data, uh, we will show the table. Otherwise, no data message. And the table needs to be imported from uh, semantic UI React. Okay. So back here, let's look at the screen. Okay, now <clears throat> uh, it's possible that, yeah, it was uh, set on responsive. Our table <laughs> looks good. It's really empty. We'll, we'll see immediately how to improve it, but it has the data. And how, do, how did we go about displaying that data? Um, I see a console log with the file data. Let's see, we, we, uh, we have the file data and that file data is stored in the data array, okay? We have the fields that we saw in the meta, this array. So we will iterate over the fields and for each, uh, item uh, for for each field name basically uh, we will create a new table cell in the table header and the content of that cell will be the field we will use the field name as key which could be uh, <coughs> sorry uh, which could be a pr problematic if we have uh, duplicate duplicate fields because uh, react will be will complain so we might be we might do something like this and the key will be uh, will be we will use string templating so right now we have a string template we are just using the f value uh, and we have to wrap it like this but we'll also use the i variable that's the index so the map takes a function that the first argument will be uh, the, the the field i mean the value that's being iterated and the next uh, argument will be the index or, or rather the iterator of that um, array mapping so now our key is let's say safer and the key uh, is used by the, this key prop is used by React uh, as an optimization. And <coughs> basically when have, whenever we have lists, React needs to know um, if it should re-render the member of that list. And it does that based on many, many things. But one of them is if the key changes. So basically, we, we, you kind of want to have the key being a direct, uh, let's say, a unique consequence of whatever you render in that component. Okay, moving on uh, into the table body. So until now, we have rendered the header. If I make this uh, screen wider, you can see. So I'm, I have rendered the header. And then in the table body, we are iterating over the file data, which we, we saw it's an array. And that array has again the an object. So basically we will have this type of object with a, a key value, key value. So field name, value, field name, value, whatever. And we will render a row for each of a, a row for each item from this array. And Inside that row, we will take the fields and iterate um, again on the fields, but we will use the field name to as a lookup key in the object. So yeah, that's it. I mean, not uh, pretty, let's say pretty basic, not uh, something fancy. <clears throat> 
Okay. Uh, now, here comes, uh, let's say, the interesting part. <clears throat> we can we can look at uh, this code and say, okay, we kind of have um, a bit too much inside. It's a bit too uh, too many concerns. We have this templating code. So we have uh, the GSX part and we also have the data fetching part and um, that's, that's, that's kind of too much. It becomes hard to understand and Another thing, it's become, it becomes hard to reuse this code. What if we want to say, okay, uh, I want to have components that, that depend on external content, that depend on content that will be fetched from uh, the backend server. In Plone, we will have something called a behavior, right? So we model this uh, thing as a behavior and uh, we will use that uh, thing. Uh, uh, we will use and reuse that thing. So in React, we don't have class in inheritance, or at least it's not uh, it's not uh, promoted. In React, we have to uh, to structure our, our code in a pattern called composition, and that means uh, we will need to <clears throat> extract the reusable bits of our code as functions and then compose these functions to create, uh, to let's say wrap it one, one another to create a single um, set of properties that are injected to the final component. <clears throat> and um, um, in React, this composition is uh, the easiest to do with the HOC pattern, the uh, higher order component pattern here. Uh, this one is more or less like a Python decorator. So <clears throat> if I will write uh, some quick code here. Okay, so uh, in let's say let's assume that I'm in Python, right? So I I can have a decorator, uh, which is a function, and uh, the decorator is applied on top of another function, and we can do uh, something. I'm decorating func, and then the decorator always needs to return another function. And of course, I'm, I'm keeping it really, really simple, uh, like the most basic decorator. The React higher order component the pattern is the same, except that, <clears throat> um, yeah, going back here, uh, our HOC, our higher order component will be a component that wraps another component and that is uh, acting like a function. So we will have const uh, and the convention is, let's say to, to write as with some sort of behavior with, I don't know, file data, let's say, and we're gonna write a function, right? And that function will be a decorator. So it needs to get the, the Com decorated component as the first argument. So that would be wrapped component. Uh, we will call it here wrapped component, but basically I, I would do uh, when I'm using this uh, uh, HOC, I'm, I will do like this with final data of some component, right? So some component here, which would be, I don't know, could be something like, it's just a div. So just a basic component. So now inside uh, this decorator, uh, we have to return a component. 
we could uh, we we could return the basic component, but if, for example, we want uh, to to pass down a particular property to that component, we have to return JSX. We have to use that component in uh, React terms. So we have to write a new component and we have to use that original component. So we have to say, okay, these are some props. So this new component will substitute this component. So whatever props we got there, we have to pass them down to uh, to, to the original component. And if, you, if we want to pass some new additional things, we could say, hey, I don't know, color, a new prop is red, or whatever, right? Uh, <clears throat> so with this simple pattern, it is possible to, um, to write reusable behaviors because here uh, in this function, but it's actually more or less a wrapping component, I can use uh, React hooks and I can use uh, React things. So I can say const, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say toggle, set toggle, just to use some sort of state is React use state. So I can use hooks and so on. So basically it's kind of like component inside component and um, this one is just logic, not presentation parts. So that means I can I can reuse uh, and I can structure my code so that it's easy to understand and easy to reuse because uh, the the network fetching code will not be again dependent on the uh, on the visual code on on the template code let's say and my template code will not be dependent on the network fetching code. Okay, <clears throat> so um, this code here with file data is just basically this code. So um, whatever whatever I have here on my on my right side on my left side. Sorry. Hold on a second. So whatever I have here, uh, and probably this thing as well, I'm just gonna remove it and put it in, uh, in this uh, higher order component. And this one will be a file called with file data. And we will put it in source hooks. <clears throat> so basically here, okay, uh, and with file data.js. And I'm gonna paste. Okay, so uh, if we ignore the tutorial for a moment and we try to look side by side, okay, uh, then yeah basically it gets everything so more or less all of this all right all of this is uh, removed and we can see that uh, here in the wrapped component we are passing file data right so now my file data will be i can do const file data is, a, is props destructured. Uh, there's another pattern where uh, if, you know, just to avoid this type of code, we can just say here, file data, because we don't actually use the props. So it could be like this. And of course, I won't have file data inside uh, so in, in, in this case, sorry, if I look at the, the code, it will probably crash or something. Let's see, no data, okay. Um, and we can, uh, we can declare, for example, a fallback like this in case, uh, in case, uh, for example, if, but I'm, I'm basically, I'm making sure here that uh, I'm passing something, but for example, 
uh, if I would pass here unde undefined, like uh, if I if I didn't have this fallback, it will crash. Now it didn't crash. So if I remove this one, no, but if I, let's see if I delete it from not, here. Yeah. We're not wrapping the hook in the table. I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to show what uh, would happen uh, if I'm not passing. I'm trying to show uh, actually the JavaScript uh, here, the, this, this feature that I can pass uh, like a default value in case, uh, in case the value is not defined. In any case, um, so let's import, let's import uh, the hawk. So import with file data from, and I'm gonna take this path and this one will be hawks and we don't have the hawks uh, index JS. So um, do I have it as a default? Yeah, it's a default. So I need to do it like this. Okay, so now let's see. Now it, it complained, it crashed, but it should work now that it's um, reading map. Now file data, data, it's empty. Uh, let's see, not a table view. No, not this one. Um, This one, uh, like this. You're uh, not. Yeah, I'm not wrapping it. I know. I know. Okay, so we have to wrap our uh, component with the hook. Now that we've uh, imported it, uh, you, rem you remember it had it has to act as decorator. So I'm I'm gonna call with file data on top of my. Uh, uh, component and looks like I can get rid of some imports and moving back. Uh, let's uh, let's do another sanity check. Let's see what I didn't do well. File data, file data. Uh, I'm Oh, okay, so uh, the thing is, this one it's supposed to be called like this, if I remember correctly. Okay, so yeah, um, let me check the tutorial just to save myself some trouble. No, it needs to be called like that. Okay, put put it initially. So um, okay, well let's let's debug it. <clears throat> First of all, let's see if um, the download is performed, and the download is not performed. So we have file data, which is with file data. Ta -ta -ta. Um, let's see. Like this. Yeah, it's our uh, class, fine. <clears throat> Um, and then we can look at uh, the props. Off. And the 
props don't okay <clears throat> it's there here but for some reason they are uh, empty no that's uh, that's from uh, data data table i i think so let me just look again at the error so file data data i hate i i should add some con condition because the, the file data is empty right now i think that's the problem right now so fields I will add the condition and file data again. The condition. Um, file data is is undefined here for some reason. Uh, and where is it? This error. <clears throat> data table view line twenty. Oh, right, file data. I have another condition to add here. Okay, well, we fixed it. Okay, just remove the logging. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure why uh, it keeps it keeps uh, breaking with unauthorized when I uh, when it hot reloads, but I, I've noticed that it does so whenever we have an error. Um, but <laughs> I let's see. So I see that file data. Probably it's because we, yeah I've, I've defined it as an as a fallback object. Again, that's that's a that's a mistake. Okay, so if we if I define the object as like this, it's an empty object, but uh, node considers it as true-ish in uh, in value. You see, so the result of that Boolean operation is true. So that's that that was my problem because I've had I've added this fallback, and when I didn't have the value, then this condition was true. So the code executed, and in the tutorial we don't have. I mean, in the training. Uh, the written training, we don't have these conditions, but they work because we didn't have uh, the fallback at the top. So if I have the fallback at the top, then yeah, better just to avoid that. Okie dokie. Well, moving on. <clears throat> now we get to, um, to the fun part, let's say, and the one where we uh, get up speed, but we have just uh, a little bit less, a little bit more than uh, half of hour left. So I wonder if uh, we want to stop here and um, have a question and answer session and just uh, chat, or should I continue? And yeah, I want I want to hear some opinion. Not not just you, David. I know you're you're here. You caught me. Now, who else? Well, if there is no uh, no one raising hands and and saying that they want uh, to go to question and answer, then we can continue with the tutorial. Um, we have the block editing with a form uh, concept. And this one is really powerful and we've started to use it in, in Volto and it's a really big productivity boost. It, um, it basically reuses the schemas that are produced by Plone REST API, uh, the ones that are used in Volto. So 
whenever I go, for example, and I add a folder. Let me check Volto. Okay, don't crash on me. Okay, so I'm back into Volto. I'm gonna reload, start the developer console, go to network, <clears throat> and if I go and add a folder. Okay, um, in here we will see the, uh, the Plone REST API endpoint, and we will see um, what we call a schema. And it's the serialization of the dexterity schema. Um, and it's in, in um, let's say, um, long REST API serialized. I think uh, this, this format mimics the JSON schema uh, with the properties and the, uh, the field sets. So basically, no, no, not the JSON schema. I don't know, I, I'm missing it right now. Uh, but the schema uh, as the most basic object is an object with title uh, required, which is an array of the, the required fields. The field sets, with, uh, which is basically uh, the different tabs, let's say, the field sets. And um, in the properties, we have the definition of the, the, the widgets. So for example, if we track it down, the title field is gonna be of type string. The subject will be something really fancy, which is, is an array. So the subject field is the tags. So I can, I can write here some stuff, right? So this one is an array. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what else? Uh, something like exclude from navigation, you see type Boolean. If we look, exclude from navigation, it's just a checkbox and so on. And uh, you, can, you can see here that it, it uses the, I mean, the widget lookup mechanism in Volto has to understand this uh, Plone REST API schema. Now, in the client side uh, forms, what we're actually doing is to uh, appropriate the schema and to reuse it and, and to uh, reuse the form uh, components in Volto uh, to declare JavaScript code with this type of schema that can, uh, that can use the form component and render uh, the, the form, but not with information coming from a Plone REST API from dexterity content, but with something that uh, we define in JavaScript. And the fact that uh, we are manipulating the schema inside JavaScript, it means that unlike Plone and unlike dexterity, it is really, really easy to have dynamic schemas and all kinds of fancy things, the, the kind of things that will take <laughs> days and weeks of work to, uh, to do in, uh, in dexterity and backend code. Okie dokie. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we will define, uh, so the task that we're trying to approach right now is uh, in the beginning, I've ha I have shown that in the block configuration, we had code that was able to, to change and define settings for the table uh, so that we can, we can make uh, the table uh, uh, basically what we're going to do is more or less implement the formatting. Yeah, well, page, 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 page. So now if I add if I add a table block, not a not a data table, but a table block, 
think it's in common. Now, this table block is the editable table from Volto. And this table block has the, the options, right? We're gonna add the options and we're gonna implement it. And uh, once we achieve that, I'm gonna show you the Volto code, which is old style, and we can compare it to the new style of code that uses the client side schema. And you can see that uh, it's a big improvement. Okay, so uh, yeah, we have the schema. <clears throat> and we're going to create a new file. We're going to call it schema. Uh, and the schema in our case, but it doesn't have to be, but the, the convention is like this, uh, but the, we create the schema with a function. Uh, this one could have been missing. We could have it like this. And uh, yeah, uh, it could be just a JavaScript object, but sometimes you have to get some, uh, some things from the data or you can, you can, <clears throat> a, a nice pattern, for example, is that uh, we are able to, to conditionally add new fields to be rendered. So for that one, for that reason, we make the schema a function. I mean, we, we use a function to create the schema. Uh, and that function, the, the convention is that it gets a form data and the Intel object, which is uh, the object used for internationalization. And it returns uh, a basic schema. In our case, so we have a single field set with uh, just the description field. And uh, we will define that, uh, that description field to be a text area. And it's just gonna have a title. But I think this schema is just uh, just, an, <clears throat> just an example. Because the real table schema will be this one. And I'm going to copy it from here. And then we can take a look to see what it has. OK. So in the real table schema uh, object, we say title table, uh, we will use the Intel uh, object to interna internationalize and, and uh, instead of hard coding as a string, the title, we will pass an Intel message and this one, the default field set, right? So we will have lower down the screen in the file. We will have this type of uh, defined messages uh, call <clears throat> and inside we define each international internationalized message uh, which will have the default message and an ID and it will be inside an object and we will be able to uh, to call it by that ID so uh, we will have messages the variable and inside it we will have uh, the various messages. So, okay, we will have two, two field sets and the fields, but I guess the easiest way to see what it does is to actually render that uh, form. So <clears throat> now let's go back to our data table edit component. And we're going to basically replace this section with uh, the form that reads the schema and will render that schema. And <clears throat> uh, let me just check that I'm getting the proper things. Uh, okay, to, to avoid some possible problems, I will just take all of this and replace it. Okay, so now um, we have the inline form, we have a schema. 
um, that we have to de define. And uh, the inline form is something that we can import for from uh, Volto components. Okay. And the schema, we'll have to import it as well. Uh, if, you screen, if you saw the screen jump, that was just a file auto formatting. Uh, so we will uh, have, we will import the <clears throat> table schema from this module and we will do table schema and we're just going to pass our props and let's, oh my God. Let's look in the browser at our data table and in the edit, if it doesn't crash, it's hooray, we got something. So uh, what did we get? Let me make this smaller so that we can put it side by side. And we can look at the schema. <clears throat> so we have two field sets. One will have only the file path. And the field set in the sidebar is rendered with an accordion like this. But the first field set is not in the accordion. So in the default field set, we will have a file path. And then uh, we'll have another field set called a style that could be any name, but that we will give it a title and it will appear here as the accordion title. And inside we will do, we'll have some um, fields, basically six fields, fix cell, blah, 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 one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. And they will be all Booleans as defined here, right? So our file path object um, field, we have defined it with the object browser mode link. And it's here. If I delete, basically I have to pick it again, pick it up again. It works. And we have uh, the schema. <clears throat> okay, so let's just do some random uh, editing here. And let's see how uh, that one reflects in the blob data. Components, let's inspect the table. Data table view, table, it's good, data table view. Okay, fine. <clears throat> Let me make this one bigger. So, <clears throat> we have whatever was inside uh, the, the, the uh, schema became a property in the data. And we will look immediately how that was done. So basic, true, cell, true. So everything that, that was here, just, just uh, now I can see that they have toggled. So to false, let's check, you see? Self is now false, now it's true and so on. So right away we can see that editing the schema here in the sidebar has an effect inside the data of that block. And that is because um, <clears throat> that is because we had we, we used the inline form component, we passed down the schema and the inline form component uh, accept, accepts um, one property called on change field. And basically that one is executed whenever one of the fields inside that schema changes. One, I mean, one of the, one of the widget changes values. 
And just like we had before, and that's why I, I thought it was important to understand how the widget works. Just like we had before, uh, we, are change, we are calling on change block. So if, for example, I'm gonna separate, I'm just gonna copy this and I, I will undo, okay. And I will paste it here. Okay, <clears throat> so just uh, to get rid of this ugly uh, color. Okay, so just like we had before, on change ID value on change block. It's similar here, ID value on change block data. So very very similar API. And another um, another thing that's really really important to keep in mind. Um, when writing widget, don't feel tempted to use inner state inside the widget because it doesn't make sense. Um, when you write a widget, let's say, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> now I messed it up. I, I, I got back to the version yeah, I'll, I'll need to redo this on one moment and I will carry on. Okay, oh, now it should be good. <clears throat> okay, so back to my uh, don't use state in uh, widgets explanation. Let's assume, um, let's assume that I'm writing, I don't know, a news item. I'm writing here a value. And you, you will have, you will, have this widget, you will define a state and that state you will just update it with, with the widget value because you need a React control component and so on. And what you will have to do is basically whenever that state changes, you have to change the on change value uh, callback. So then if you have to do that and basically you will also have to watch the incoming value to update the state of the widget uh, when when it changes from the, the outside. That basically uh, means that the inner state of that widget is absolutely irrelevant and you don't need it. And um, the only case where you actually would need a state for a component, for a, let's say a widget, would be in the case where you, for example, you want to, to have a model or you want to have a dialogue with a confirmation uh, button. Because then here, yeah, it makes sense that I keep an internal state and I only transfer that state to the parent component only when I have the confirmation from the user. Other, in other cases, no, don't do it, it's not needed. <clears throat> okay, now um, we take this really, really simple um, formatting function and we're going to put it in the data table component. And we're gonna use that function. So basically the function goes in here, in the type, uh, table as uh, my mouse is, uh, so before we had celled, right? But now 
we don't have to hard code the formatting because we can say, hey, just format uh, based on the data and the format, if you look, it returns, uh, yeah. I need to add also the data as a property. Um, so basically that was, the data is a field inside the props object. Okay, so um, this format, it's a function, it gets the data and the data we saw that it has all, all of these uh, formatting options as booleans. And we will basically return this, this uh, object with, uh, with the options. And these ones, they will become properties to the table. Now, how do, you, how do we know which props we should, uh, we should pass? That's easy. You have to look inside the React some semantic UI. So not semantic UI, but semantic UI React. So if we look at the table component, the props, we can see, for example, fixed, compact, basic. So basic is here. The cell is here, and you, you can see that they are all uh, booleans. Uh, compact, so if it's a boolean, uh, then inverted, it could be, and so on. <clears throat> so now let's see if, uh, if our data table is also formatted. I'm not sure why my uh, mouse is misbehaving. So let's do reduce table complexity. Yeah, it's already responding. So really, re, uh, alternate, yeah, see. Uh, hey, even uh, inverted. <clears throat> so we can, uh, a really easy implement uh, something like fancy formatting. And uh, I've also mentioned that this is a lot easier than what's uh, being done right now in Volto. And that's, uh, that's something for us or for, <laughs> for the Plone community actually, now that uh, Volto is the default face of Plone, <clears throat> that's something for the Plone community to improve. Because if we look at the table view component, uh, but it's used for the table block, blocks table view. <clears throat> I mean, this one is fine. That's not, uh, not the issue, but editing that data. So we should look uh, for, for example, compact. Right. We have all of these functions that just that just uh, toggle one of the options on and off, which is striking. I mean, yeah, whatever. And then we have a huge list of everything that's uh, that's used to edit the, uh, the formatting options. So in the end, we get to quite a big, uh, big file, like 744. As, and, and not all of this will be dedicated to that part of uh, editing the, um, of the formatting of the table, but a big part of this will be for that. And it, so that's why uh, using the schema will greatly, greatly simplify um, such a boring and usual task. I mean, I, you don't want to, to have to just uh, write field like this on and on and on because they can be mostly automated with the schema. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so, um, no, I just closed too much. Let's see what else we have. Okay, so now we will have uh, another uh, block data as a reusable pattern. Um, and another another uh, hook, another uh, higher order component uh, 
<clears throat> uh, concept. And that is with block data source. So when uh, we've created our data table object uh, block, right? This one. I mean, I'm not going to be able to delete it. <laughs> so I should just uh, start a new page, maybe. OK, so I have I have this uh, this look and feel for the data table block. <clears throat> so in the sidebar, we get uh, some details that it's not filled in. Uh, here in the main part, we have some uh, uh, we have a file picker. Uh, in uh, in a complex website, this would become uh, something that you would see on and on and on repeated uh, to many, many components. For example, instead of uh, the data table, I might uh, have, uh, I might use that CSV file, for example, to plug data inside a chart or to plug data inside uh, 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 something else. I don't know, a map, How, who knows? <clears throat> so this, this sort of code we want to reuse. And we can do that with a, a higher order component. Again, we just have to restructure our code a bit so that in the end, instead of having uh, <clears throat> these conditions on and on and on, because we don't actually care except uh, when we, so we don't really care uh, if we don't have the data, we don't, I, we don't care about this, right? We only care about what happens when we have the data. So let's put that aside. Let's make it a reusable behavior, a reusable higher order component and uh, be able to reuse it in uh, another block. <clears throat> Okie dokie. So, um, just like before, we will create a new uh, HOC with block data source. We will do it inside the Hox folder. With block data source.js. And I'm going to take the code. <clears throat> And I'm going to just stick it here and we'll look at what we have. Uh, I will put side by side and we can check. <clears throat> so um, basically this pattern fills in the main block uh, side, the, the view, let's say. And it's gonna render that uh, file picker, and it also fills the sidebar with with the um, with the fallback form. Let's say. <clears throat> so, for example, if I try to clean up the file, um, I wouldn't have this sidebar portal. But let's just uh, pick. Uh, the component from the tutorial because it will be easier. And I, I cannot really uh, program while talking. That's, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that it happens with uh, everybody. Okay, so the tutorial says also to update the hooks the, in the index file. So we will say export with block data source. Um, like this, <clears throat> okay. And then uh, the edit component, I'm pretty sure that it's gonna be greatly simplified. Yeah. So uh, we'll just have this as the return value. So uh, I'm on my right side. Let me let me close. I'm on my right side. Data table component. I'm just I'll just replace all of this, and I'll just put the return 
and uh, I, I'll be able to clean up imports. <clears throat> okay, now I won't get anything if I if I'm gonna check my browser right now. Yeah. Uh, and I will clear it. No data, right? There's no no smart behavior, and I get the uh, the default form. That is because we haven't actually used the hawk yet. So if we go back, and I'm gonna copy this line and rewrite this, and I will need. I will need that one, so I'm not going to delete it. Okay. And I will need uh, with block data source. Clone collective volto data table tutorial and then. <coughs> Like so. Now, <clears throat> this uh, hawk, and uh, we'll just briefly discuss it, and uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, we'll continue tomorrow. With block data source, uh, it's you see, it gets it gets uh, parameters, it gets arguments. So that that means that the hawk in itself will be a function that. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, this one. So it will be a function that gets the options and it will return another function that gets the wrapped component. So um, <clears throat> if you've seen in Python, uh, let's see, if, if you have seen this, uh, let's say view, right? And then we have, um, Let's say let's say I would have a decorator browser view, and I will call it with path equals I don't know index, and uh, permissions is view, right? That would be a decorator that receives arguments. So that means that this decorator, when you implement it, it will have to be first a function that gets the gets the uh, arguments then it needs to return the actual decor decorator. So it, it would be kind of like this the uh, browser view of uh, options. And I would define decorator that would return the function, uh, that would uh, decorate the function and it will return whatever but it needs to return the function or something about that function. And I'm, I need to return here um, the decorator, right? So that is just, uh, just to, to be able to have access in a closure uh, to, the, to the options, but also in here I, can, I will have action, I will have access to the options. Okay, so the, the function inside the function and so on. So in this case here, we have the same case, right? We have uh, with block data source is not the real hawk, but it's, it's a function that returns the hawk. Uh, it's a function that uh, gets the options, this ones, and then it has them in the closure and then it returns the real uh, hawk. So with this one, basically we we had uh, the code that was uh, before in the tab uh, data table edit, and we have generalized it and we have it uh, wrapped and and put aside so it's a reusable thing and we can compose it everywhere like just like this. So okay, well uh, it's getting late. I think. <laughs> I think we are, uh, our time is up and uh, I'm uh, really glad that uh, you were uh, able to participate in the training so far. 
and uh, just to have patience and watch uh, whatever I'm doing here and I'm explaining. And I hope uh, I hope that you have picked up uh, a few tips and tricks and how to work with Polvo. And uh, yeah, if you want to stick around, we'll uh, see each other in the chat. And then, uh, yeah, uh, if you ask, if you have questions or uh, comments, uh, add them in the chat. Um, it would be really a good, great to hear from you tomorrow morning. If tomorrow, uh, uh, at the when we resume the training, if you have uh, tested and if you have tried to uh, follow uh, our tutorial here. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> Thank you and see you tomorrow. Likewise. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you.